that very generous introduction. It's really a pleasure and privilege to uh, be here this evening. It's not often that I get to uh, speak at an American Jewish organization that's approaching 170 years. Really, uh, well, 170th birthday. We haven't had many Jewish organizations in America that have celebrated. I did a little research, and 100 years ago, uh, at your 70th birthday, William Howard Taft spoke at Temple Bethel in New York at, at, at the celebration of your 70th birthday, and he began by saying, 70 years in the life of the Jewish race is very short. I like short things. Half, half is very large. But uh, I will suffice it to say that, you know, I'm a Jewish historian. Even 170 years in the life of the Jewish people, as we would now say, is very short. But in terms of American Jewish organizations, a lifespan of 170 is most remarkable and unprecedented. It is really a great uh, historical milestone. Now, I do want to thank my uh, good friend and our distinguished alumnus of the Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership Program at Brandeis, Dan Mariachin, for inviting me uh, here this uh, evening. And I also want to thank him. He kindly spoke about my book, but I want to thank him for opening uh, B'nai Grit's historic archive to me. It was then still in Washington uh, when I was researching uh, the book, and I learned a lot of things in the archive. That's how I knew how important it was. Um, and the most surprise discovery, in some ways, from my perspective, was a confidential letter that Mount Carmel Lodge in Cincinnati circulated to other Fenegrit lodges in the very midst of the Civil War. So this is it's marked top secret, so please don't tell anyone. Uh, and, and it read, information has been received here, doubtless authentic, proving the fact that certain of our co-religionists being engaged in an illegal traffic and other acts of disloyalty with those who are in rebellion against the government. We fraternally call your attention to this subject, urging your vigilance to suppress all acts of disloyalty, especially among those who style themselves members of the day grit. <laughs> now, what we see here is evidence that many Jews knew that some of their fellow Jews, like, of course, lots of non-Jews, were engaged in smuggling uh, during the Civil War. No great surprise, you could make 500% on your money if you smuggled in both directions. It was very tempting. But we see at the same time that the day grit held itself to a higher standard and attempted to suppress that smuggling, recognizing how dangerous it could be to the American Jewish community's reputation and standing. So uh, in that case, in the midst of the Civil War, uh, as so often in its history, B'nai Grit was reminding Jews not only to think about themselves, but also to think about what we might today call Klal Yisrael, the Jewish community as a whole. Now, another section of my book that was greatly assisted by your archives concerns the great B'nai Grit leader and American Jew, Benjamin Franklin Peshoto. A whole lecture to Peshoto from a very famous Sephardic family. Um, he had a very fine mind and a well honed political sense. He actually trained under Stephen A. Douglas. Remember the Lincoln Douglas debates? 
Uh, I, I like that was he was known as the little giant, and uh, 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 Lincoln towered uh, over him. Little known fact in the uh, had it been television, it would have been altogether different. The Lincoln Douglas debate, um, but anyway, for, uh, the show rose to serve uh, Benet Griffiths. Uh, as Rene Griffith's national president in those days, you're a grand star. That's what the title was. He was uh, only in his 30s. That's maybe be the youngest national president in the history of Rene Griffith. And later on, in 1870, uh, thanks to President Grant, as you read in the book, and to the great Rene Griffith leader, Simon Wolfe, who for a moment was in prison during the Civil War um, uh, because they thought that a grit was a subversive organization. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, our friend Pichotto was uh, sailed off to Bucharest, Romania to serve as America's consul in Bucharest. And one of the interesting things I found was that actually America was quite poor at that time. We spent a lot of money on wars. It never happens today, and the country was in a very serious uh, financial situation. So they didn't pay consuls. Uh, and as a result, the Nate Rick secretly paid uh, Consul Pichotto's salary. And that was, if I may say so, a very wise expenditure on your part because he actually, and this was expected, he spent almost all of his time working on behalf of Romania's persecuted Jews, many of whose lives he secretly saved. I actually thought that in my book, which you now have, I was telling that story uh, pretty well for the first time. And, and then I spoke uh, a few months ago at the New York Historical Society. And at that lecture, a Jew from Romania, who had left Romania, got up and declared that as a child in Romania, he had been brought up to revere the name Benjamin Franklin Pichotto, your president, uh, for his good works. It wasn't a secret to him at all. In other words, it was astonishing to me. Uh, this tradition of what Pichotto accomplished in Romania lived on for a full century following his death. And many Romanian Jews, maybe people in this room, uh, the ancestors of people in this room, eventually emigrated to America uh, because they concluded that a country that dispatched a Jewish consul to Bucharest to help oppress Jews was a country where they themselves would find freedom and opportunity. So the takeaway lesson is that good deeds pay rich dividends. Pichotto's work, which you did so much to advance, was remembered for generations, even in the dark days of communism. And that seems to me well worth recalling today at a time when, as a country, and many Jewish organizations as well often think too much about the short term, the next quarter, the next election. The Jewish people, by contrast, has a long-term vision. And I like to think, so does B'nai B'rith. Maybe that's why 170 years is but a short term in our historical experience. Now, Benigrin's history is actually replete with stories like Pichotto's, stories that show Benigrin both engaging and shaping Jewish history from, 19, from 1843 to the present. And for this reason, it is really a source of enormous 
pleasure and pride for me that you did select the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives as the home uh, for your priceless historical records. I've been associated with those archives for 35 years. Uh, I chair its academic board, actually. I put the records of my own father. My father, as some of you know, is Professor Nathan Sarno, the great Bible scholar. Uh, I put my father's records in those same archives. I'm very proud and pleased that uh, his records rest next to your records. And I can tell you with some great assurance uh, that your records are in very good hands. Uh, at this moment, really, uh, at this time, they're being uh, organized and processed and properly preserved in acid-free folders and containers. And uh, I think in the years ahead, there will be an explosion of new scholarship concerning B'nai Brit's activities. Uh, and you should truly congratulate uh, yourselves for having preserved so many invaluable records uh, from your past, which is really an American jury's past. Now, since we are talking history, it is worth pausing uh, today to recall what was going on in this country exactly 150 years ago, almost to the day, and only miles from where we now sit. War of 1812. Not uh, 150 years ago. Uh, you see, we unfortunately have too many wars. Uh, they, uh, I, I refer uh, 150 years ago to the Civil War, uh, the end of August 1862, so at the second battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, depends on where you grew up, what you call it. Uh, Manassas, little known fact, was named apparently for an 18th century <coughs> Jewish innkeeper in Virginia uh, named Manasseh. Uh, but alas, we should remember over 18,000 troops were killed or wounded in that terrible battle results of which, of course, were inconclusive. On September the 15th of that year, so that's why I say we're exactly approaching 150 years, came the Battle of Harper's Ferry in West Virginia, one of the worst Union defeats in the Civil War. General Stonewall Jackson captured 12,000 Union troops, some 200 others were killed or wounded. And then two days after that, the Battle of Antietam, the anniversary of Rosh Hashanah this year, was fought near Sharpsburg, Maryland. Antietam was the bloodiest single day battle in all of American history. Six generals killed, about 23,000 casualties on both sides in less. 24 hours. Um, it may have been a turning point in the Civil War. It ended uh, the invasion of the North, but it leaves us to remember a hundred, uh, what, what went on in this country 150 years ago and what a price uh, was paid. And it's against that background of Americans killing other Americans in horrific and un unprecedented numbers that you, as B'nai B'rith, rewrote your constitution in 1863, right in the middle of the Civil War, and what did you stress? The idea of unity. The independent order B'nai B'rith, the new constitution read, has taken upon itself the mission of uniting the sons of Israel in the sacred work of promoting the highest interests of humanity and to promulgate the sublime and eternal doctrines of Judaism among its professors and to defend, preserve, and diffuse the faith of our fathers. But they print in that constitution set forth a series of cardinal principles 
the first and most important being, quote, all men are brothers, sons of one God, vested with the same inalienable rights. 150 years ago, in 1863, that was a radical and critical principle. All men, today we would say all people, it was an amazing idea. It was critical and radical for Americans at large, and yes, for the Jewish people as well. This idea that all Jews, wherever they come from, wherever they live, whether they are religious or irreligious, whether they are politically liberal or politically conservative, all Jews form part of a common bridge or covenant that binds the one to another into a single fraternity devoted to benevolence and brotherly love and harmony. Abraham, so important in Jewish life. You embody the audacious idea that all Jews are interrelated and interdependent. When a Jew is persecuted in Moscow or Ethiopia or attacked on the streets of London or Paris or hit by rocket fire in Stadon or threatened in Tehran, all B'nai Brick members, indeed all Jews everywhere, are supposed to feel the pain. We do so because we see those suffering Jews who we don't personally know and who we likely have never met as part of our collective Brick. They are our extended family our mishpacha, part of one covenant. That's what it means. That links us all together. And this value was indeed articulated well by the ancient rabbis who point all Jews are responsible for one another. So when that Missouri Lodge that Dan was talking about wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln on January the 5th, 1863, protesting Ulysses S. Grant's General Orders Number 11, expelling Jews as a class from his war zone, they were expressing that <coughs> fundamental value of Jews being responsible for one another. Missouri was not part of Grant's war zone. It would have been easy for Missouri Jews, who certainly had plenty enough troubles of their own in the Civil War, to have said, Jews are being expelled from Holly Springs, Mississippi, and Paducah, Kentucky. That's far away. Not our problem. Not our responsibility. Instead, the loyal members of Benadryl in the midst of war, and there was a great deal of turmoil and warfare in, in, in Missouri at that time, they took time to compose a magnificent petition. I advise you all to read it. It is preserved, not in your archive, because it was sent to Abraham Lincoln, so it is preserved in the Library of Congress, and as you heard, it was displayed at the White House this year. That petition defended their fellow Jews and called upon Abraham Lincoln to revoke Ulysses S. Grant's order. Listen to a little bit of it. In the name of religious liberty of justice on humanity, we enter our solemn protest against this order and ask of you, meaning Abraham Lincoln, to annul that order and to protect the liberty even of your humblest constituents. Lincoln, as we know, did revoke that order, and the fact that B'nai Brith members and other Jews from all parts of the country 
rose up in defense of their fellow Jews in Kentucky and Tennessee and Mississippi, even in the midst of war, that fact was not lost upon Americans of that day. They received an object lesson in what it means that all Jews are responsible for one another. Now today, sadly, this idea of mutual Jewish responsibility of Klau Yisrael, indeed the idea that all Jews are in a sense B'nai Brit, bearers of a common covenant, that idea has fallen into steep decline, most especially among young Jews. Indeed, in many circles, peoplehood has become nothing less than an endangered Jewish value. One recent survey found that a bare majority of American Jews still warm to the concept of Jewish peoplehood. 52% only. That means 48% disagree. 52% agreed with the statement, I look at the entire Jewish community as my extended Jewish family. And even less than half, 47% only, felt that I have a special responsibility to take care of Jews in need around the world. Now, as for young Jews, a recent survey entitled Young Jewish Adults in the United States Today discloses only 29% of respondents aged 25 to 34 stated that they have a sense of belonging to the Jewish only 29% have a sense of belonging to the Jewish people, and only a quarter of young Jews feel that they have a special responsibility with, and a special relationship with, and responsibility for other Jews. In short, for many American Jews today, not the people in this room, but for many American Jews today, Judaism may mean religion or some sense of heritage, <clears throat> not a sense of peoplehood or a shared grid or covenant, much less a feeling of mutual obligation toward all Jews everywhere. I could give lots of reasons why that hasn't occurred, uh, but the hour is late. And my message to you this evening is that the basic value of B'nai Brit, the Klau Yisrael idea that all Jews are responsible for one another, is worth preserving. And you have a great role to play in that much needed effort. The radical notion that all Jews are responsible responsible for one another, whether we know them or not, like them or not, agree with them or not, simply because all Jews are family, that idea, as I said, has been centrally important in the Negrit history, in Jewish history generally, and in many respects, it is centrally responsible for our survival under adversity. To this day, millions of Jews are alive because other Jews reached out to save them during times of persecution. In our own lifetimes, the successful movement to save Soviet Jews and Ethiopian Jews relied on this deeply felt sense of mutual <coughs> responsibility. It has saved more lives than any other Jewish value I can think of. Indeed, this sense of shared peoplehood, far from being outmoded, seems to me to be a cutting edge idea when the others might want to learn from 
our Jewish example. The world we live in would be infinitely better off if Klau Yisrael had feelings, feelings of grit, of kinship and mutual responsibility became pervasive among all peoples and among all faiths here in America and around the world. The more we do care about one another, the better our world will be. How can B'nai B'rith help? First, simply by recommitting yourselves to the value of Klal Yisrael, you make a crucial, important statement. A great many Jewish institutions today are denominational or political. They reach out only to Jews who share their political outlooks or beliefs. The name Rit has always been open to a wide range of Jews, and nowadays it embraces women as well as men and Jews of every stripe and opinion. It is a microcosm of the Jewish community as a whole, and thank God you still articulate the ideal of mutual Jewish responsibility. Second, B'nai Brit is international. You remind us that American Jews are connected and should be connected by a common grid with Jews, as you heard, from over 50 countries around the world. Even if Jews may no longer be able to pray together, demonstrate that we can still work together to advance human rights, to help protect Jewish communities worldwide, to promote better relations with the state of Israel. The more you help us understand the challenges faced by Jews in all corners of the world, the more likely we are to appreciate Jewish peoplehood in all of its dimensions. Finally, B'nai Brith helps to promote pride in Jewish peoplehood. Many of us in our work today world, we too, are committed to objectivity. We are obliged to be dispassionate, even-handed, impartial. So many places like this one, where we can be openly and exuberantly passionate about being part of the Jewish people. Here in B'nai B'rith, all Jews can feel passionate about our values, our history, our culture, our homeland, and about Jews around the world. Most of all, we can suffer being men and women bound together by a common shared covenant of Jewish peoplehood and mutual responsibility. That is what B'nai B'rith has been all about for 170 years. May you continue in the words of the psalmist, May Chayel El Chayel from strength to strength. Thank you.